In this section, we'll look at the arteries and veins of the head and neck. First, we'll look at the two major arteries that supply the region. Then, we'll look at the blood vessels inside the cranial cavity, then at the ones outside it. On each side, two major arteries, the common carotid and the subclavian, emerge through the opening at the top of the chest, the superior thoracic aperture. To see them, we'll look at a dissection in which we've already removed the overlying structures. The sternocleidomastoid muscle, the infrahyoid muscles, and the internal jugular vein. Here's the clavicle. The first rib is here. This is the anterior scalene muscle. Here's the trachea. Here's the thyroid gland. Here are the common carotid and subclavian arteries coming up through the superior thoracic aperture. As seen in tape 3, these arise from the arch of the aorta, the two on the left directly, the two on the right indirectly from the brachiocephalic artery. We'll look at the subclavian artery first. On each side, the subclavian artery passes upwards and laterally, giving off these branches, which we'll see in a moment. It then passes behind this muscle, the anterior scalene, crossing the underlying first rib as it does so. Emerging here, it runs down beneath the clavicle toward the axilla to supply the upper extremity. The branches that arise from the subclavian artery in the base of the neck are the internal thoracic, the thyrocervical trunk, which we'll remove, and this important branch, the vertebral artery, which we'll come back to shortly. We'll leave the subclavian artery for now and follow the common carotid artery. The common carotid artery runs upward, lateral to the thyroid gland, the trachea, and the larynx. A little below the level of the angle of the mandible, which is here, the common carotid divides into the external and internal carotid arteries. To see these more clearly, we'll take the parotid gland and the ramus of the mandible out of the picture. At the bifurcation of the common carotid, which is better seen in this more typical specimen, there's a widening of the carotid sinus. Usually, the internal carotid artery runs almost straight upwards. But in this dissection, the one we'll be following, it takes quite a forward curve. The branches of the external carotid arteries supply the skull, the dura, and all of the head outside the cranial cavity, apart from the orbit. The brain is supplied by the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries. We'll move on now to follow those arteries into the cranium and look at their branches. To follow the internal carotid artery, we'll take the external carotid and its branches out of the picture. We'll also remove the posterior belly of the digastric, the styloid process, and the muscles that arise from it. The internal carotid artery runs upwards to the base of the skull without branching. The internal jugular vein is lateral to it, here. The internal carotid artery enters the carotid canal, which is here in the dry skull. The carotid canal immediately turns to run forwards and medially. To see the other end of the carotid canal, we'll go all the way round to the inside. The carotid canal comes from this direction and ends here at the foramen lacerum. To expose the internal carotid, we'll first remove the dura of the middle cranial fossa, then we'll remove this structure, the trigeminal ganglion, and finally these three cranial nerves, the third, fourth, and sixth. Here's the internal carotid artery coming up out of the foramen lacerum. The internal carotid artery here lies within an irregular cavity, the cavernous sinus, that's a passageway for venous blood. We'll see it later in this section. The artery turns to run forwards and then makes a complete 180-degree turn. This turn 
takes it under the anterior clinoid process and brings it out here, just below and behind the optic canal. The internal carotid artery finally emerges through the dura, just beneath the optic nerve. As it completes its backward turn, it gives off a branch, the ophthalmic artery. To see that, we'll remove the optic nerve and the dura beneath it. Here's the start of the ophthalmic artery. It runs forwards into the optic canal, along with the optic nerve. The ophthalmic artery supplies the contents of the orbit and continues forward to supply the central part of the forehead. To see how the internal carotid artery ends, we'll add its last part and the optic chiasm to the picture. The internal carotid artery ends by emerging from beneath the chiasm, curving laterally as it does so. We'll follow its branches in a minute. Now we'll follow the course of the other major artery to the brain, the vertebral artery. As we've seen, the vertebral artery arises from the subclavian artery in the root of the neck. It runs straight upwards and disappears to pass through the opening in the transverse process of the sixth cervical vertebra. To follow its course, we'll remove all the neck muscles and the tissues between the transverse processes. The vertebral artery runs upwards through the transverse processes of the upper six cervical vertebrae. Here's the vertebral artery. The two vertebral arteries pass through these openings in each vertebra. After passing through the transverse process of the atlas, the artery turns backwards and then medially to pass through the antplanto-occipital membrane and the dura just below the foramen magnum, which is here. To follow the vertebral artery, we'll divide the cranium along this line and remove the brain. Here are the two vertebral arteries passing through the dura. The vertebral arteries join together, forming this large artery, the basilar artery, which runs upwards and forwards above and behind the basilar part of the occipital bone. Now that we've followed the internal carotid and vertebral arteries into the cranial cavity, we'll see how they supply the brain. We'll also see the set of arterial connections known as the arterial circle or circle of Willis. So far, we've seen the internal carotids entering up here, the vertebral arteries entering down here and joining to form the basilar artery. Now, we'll complete the picture. To name the vessels we're looking at, we'll start with the main branches of the internal carotid. The internal carotid gives off the anterior cerebral and posterior communicating arteries, then continues with a different name. From here, the vessel is called the middle cerebral artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries curve towards each other above the chiasm, then pass upwards and forwards, close together, to enter the longitudinal cerebral fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres. Just above the optic chiasm, the two anterior cerebral arteries are connected to each other by this very short anterior communicating artery, which is part of the arterial circle. The middle cerebral artery, which is the direct continuation of the internal carotid, curves laterally. It enters the lateral cerebral fissure between the frontal and temporal lobes. We'll follow it there shortly. The pale areas on this artery are patches of atheroma. Now we'll go around to a view from behind to see the vertebral and basilar arteries and the vessels that arise from them. Here are the two vertebral arteries joining together to form the basilar artery. Down here, four inferior cerebellar arteries usually arise, two posterior and two anterior. These are the posterior ones. In this specimen, the anterior ones are represented by this one vessel, 
In addition, the basilar artery gives off small branches to the pons and this labyrinthine artery that supplies the inner ear. Four branches arise from the top of the basilar artery, these two superior cerebellar arteries, and the two terminal branches of the basilar, the posterior cerebral arteries. The posterior cerebral artery curves backwards and laterally above this nerve, the ocular motor. It curls around the cerebral peduncle. We'll look at its course in a few minutes. Just as it turns, the posterior cerebral artery is joined by this small artery that we've seen already, the posterior communicating artery. The posterior communicating artery completes the arterial circle. The arterial circle provides connections between the right and left sides and also connects the vertebral and internal carotid systems. It's more of a hexagon than a circle. Its component parts from front to back are the anterior communicating artery, the anterior cerebral arteries, the internal carotids, the posterior communicating arteries, and the posterior cerebral arteries. The arrangement is often somewhat asymmetrical. Here, the left posterior communicating artery is very small. The vessels we're looking at lie in the confined space between the floor of the cranial cavity and the underside of the brain. To see how they're related to the brain, we'll look at a brain that's been removed from the body together with its arteries. The arteries have been filled with red latex. Over this area, the arachnoid layer and the many small vessels in it have been removed so that we can see the major arteries. Here's the optic chiasm. Here beneath it are the divided ends of the internal carotid arteries. Here's the anterior cerebral artery passing around the optic chiasm, which will pull downwards. Here's the anterior communicating artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries turn upwards to enter the longitudinal cerebral fissure. We'll follow them shortly. The internal carotid, which we'll go back to, gives off the posterior communicating artery, then continues to become the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery enters the lateral cerebral fissure between the frontal and temporal lobes of the cerebral hemisphere. Coming from below, here are the two vertebral arteries joining to form the basilar artery, which is quite off-center in this specimen. Here are three of the possible four inferior cerebellar arteries. Here are the two superior cerebellar arteries. Here's the division of the basilar into the two posterior cerebral arteries. To follow the course of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, we'll divide the brain in the midline and look at just one cerebral hemisphere. Each anterior cerebral artery runs upwards and then backwards, close to the corpus callosum. It gives off branches which supply this area on the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere and which then reach over the superior margin of the hemisphere to supply this area on the lateral aspect. Next we'll follow the middle cerebral artery. Here it is again, running in the depths of the lateral cerebral fissure. The middle cerebral artery gives off branches which emerge along the length of the lateral cerebral fissure to supply this area on the lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. Lastly, we'll follow the posterior cerebral artery. It runs laterally, just above this nerve, the ocular motor, then runs backward, passing around the cerebral peduncle. To follow it, we'll again look at the cerebral hemisphere by itself. Here's the posterior cerebral artery. It winds around between the cerebral peduncle, which has been divided here, and the most medial part of the temporal lobe. The posterior cerebral artery gives off branches which supply this area on the medial aspect and underside of the hemisphere 
and this aspect on the lateral aspect. Now that we've seen the principal arteries of the brain, we'll move on to look at its veins and at the channels that its veins drain into, the venous sinuses. The brain is richly covered with veins. Over the surface of the cerebral hemispheres, the veins emerge from the sulci, join with one another, and run upwards within the arachnoid layer. Here, behind the midbrain, veins converge from many directions to form this great cerebral vein. We'll see where that goes shortly. These veins drain into the venous sinuses, which are a special feature of the cranial cavity. We'll look at these next. The sinuses that drain almost all the blood from the brain are the two sagittal sinuses, the straight sinus, and the two transverse sinuses. These sinuses are closely related to the major folds in the dura that we saw in an earlier section, the falx and the tentorium. In this specimen, there are some openings in the falx, which is not unusual. The two sagittal sinuses run the length of the falx. The smaller inferior sagittal sinus runs within its free border. The larger superior sagittal sinus runs within its attached border. Blood in both the sagittal sinus flows from front to back. Here, we've removed one side of the superior sagittal sinus so that we can look into it. As we saw in a previous section, the superior sagittal sinus is contained in a triangular space that's enclosed on all three sides by dura. At several places, side passages called lacunae open into the sinus. Veins from the surface of the brain open into the lacunae. The superior sagittal sinus ends where the attachments of the falx and the tentorium meet. Also running toward the same point is the straight sinus, which will lay open. The straight sinus runs along the junction between the falx and the tentorium. At its upper end, it receives the inferior sagittal sinus and also the great cerebral vein. Here, there's a major joining and branching of sinuses called the confluence of sinuses. We'll look at it in a different dissection of just the back of the head. The confluence of the sinuses is here. To see it, we'll remove the falx and the tentorium, leaving just their lines of attachment. Here's the confluence laid open. Leading from it on each side are the two major outflow channels for venous blood, the transverse sinuses. Each transverse sinus runs within the attached border of the tentorium. Starting here in the midline, the transverse sinus follows the attachment of the tentorium round to here, then continues by turning sharply downwards in this S-shaped groove just behind the petrous temporal bone. The sinus goes by two different names. This part is the transverse sinus. This part is the sigmoid sinus. To follow the sigmoid sinus, we'll look at a different skull. Here's the groove for the right sigmoid sinus, Here's the groove for the left one. They're usually unequal in size. The sigmoid sinus leaves the cranial cavity by passing through this irregular opening, the jugular foramen, along with three cranial nerves that we saw in the previous section. Here, we're looking into the posterior cranial fossa from behind. The cerebellum has been removed. We'll remove the dura that covers the sigmoid sinus. Within the jugular foramen, the end of the sigmoid sinus turns sharply downwards, becoming continuous with the internal jugular vein. As we'll see in a minute, there are also venous sinuses that drain the base of the skull. Before we see them, we need to go back to the superior sagittal sinus and look at the structures on each side of it that absorb cerebrospinal fluid. These structures, the arachnoid granulations, were left out of the picture in the earlier section on the brain. To see them, will return to this view of the surface of the brain. This central strip of dura contains the superior sagittal sinus. We'll remove the dura that forms the roof of the sinus. These small projections in the floor of the sinus, 
and on its sides are arachnoid granulations. They're upward protrusions of the arachnoid membrane. At their surface, cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space is transferred back into the bloodstream. Now we'll complete our picture of the venous sinuses by looking at the ones that drain the base of the skull. The most important of these are the two cavernous sinuses, one on each side. We saw this view of the cavernous sinus when we looked at the internal carotid artery. The cavernous sinus is the space around the artery. It extends forward to the superior orbital fissure and backwards almost to the dorsum celli. It's bounded medially by the dura that lines the pituitary fossa. As we've seen, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus contains these three cranial nerves, the third, fourth, and sixth. Outside these lies the trigeminal ganglion, and outside that, the dura of the middle cranial fossa. To get a cross-sectional view of the cavernous sinus, we'll go to a different specimen and divide it in the frontal plane along this line. This is the cavernous sinus. The big cavity in the midline is a sinus of a different order. It's the sphenoid sinus. Here's the divided internal carotid artery passing forwards. Here are cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. Here's the trigeminal ganglion. Here's the dura. Here's the pituitary gland contained within the dura that creates the pituitary fossa. The two cavernous sinuses are connected to each other behind the pituitary gland. The cavernous sinus receives blood from several sources, including the superior orbital vein, a major vein from the orbit that connects the cavernous sinus to veins in the upper part of the face. The cavernous sinus drains into the two petrosal sinuses, superior and inferior, which have been exposed on the right side. The petrosal sinuses also receive veins from the cerebellum. They empty into the sigmoid sinus, up here and under here. Now we've finished looking at the intracranial blood vessels. We'll follow the internal jugular vein in a few minutes. Let's move on now to look at the blood supply of the head and neck outside the cranial cavity. We'll look first at branches of the subclavian artery that make a contribution, then at the external carotid artery and its branches. Here's the subclavian artery again. Here's the vertebral artery, which we've seen already. Arising here in front of it is the thyrocervical trunk, a short vessel that immediately divides, giving off these branches to the shoulder region and the inferior thyroid artery. The inferior thyroid artery gives off this small ascending cervical artery, then runs medially deep to the common carotid artery to reach the lower pole of the thyroid gland. Now we'll go to a different dissection to look at the external carotid artery and its branches. We've removed the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the internal jugular vein, and the parotid gland. Here's the common carotid artery, dividing into the internal carotid and the external carotid. The external carotid artery runs upward, passing beneath the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and the stylohyoid muscle. It ends above the stylohyoid by dividing into its two terminal branches which we'll see in a minute. The first branch of the external carotid is the superior thyroid artery. It runs downwards alongside the larynx to reach the upper pole of the thyroid gland. The next branch is the lingual artery. It runs downwards and forwards, passing deep to the hyoglossus muscle to supply the tongue. To see the remaining branches of the external carotid, will remove the posterior belly of the digastric and the stylohyoid muscle. This is the facial artery. The facial artery runs forwards, 
passing between the submandibular gland and the angle of the mandible and emerging here. The facial artery crosses the mandible, it's extremely tortuous in this specimen, and runs upwards and forwards, branching to supply the lower part of the face. Here, arising posteriorly, is the occipital artery. The occipital artery runs steeply upwards, then passes deep to the digastric and splenius muscles. It re-emerges here and runs upwards, branching to supply the posterior part of the scalp. Also arising posteriorly up here is the smaller posterior auricular artery. It runs more superficially to supply the scalp behind the ear. We'll remove these two posterior branches to see one more branch that arises deeply, the ascending pharyngeal. It passes upwards, deep to the external carotid, to supply the upper part of the pharynx. Now we'll move upward to look at the last two branches of the external carotid artery. The highest part of the external carotid artery lies within the deepest part of the parotid gland, which has been removed in this dissection. This branch is the superficial temporal artery. Just as it arises, it gives off this branch, the transverse facial. The superficial temporal artery then runs upwards and laterally, emerging from behind the neck of the mandible. It crosses the zygomatic process of the temporal bone just in front of the external ear, which will add to the picture. The superficial temporal artery continues within the superficial temporal fascia, branching to supply the upper and lateral parts of the scalp. To see the final branch of the external carotid, the maxillary artery will remove this transverse facial artery. Here's the start of the maxillary artery. It arises as the continuation of the external carotid, behind and medial to the neck of the mandible. It passes forwards. To follow it, we'll remove the masseter, the zygomatic arch, the temporalis muscle, and the ramus of the mandible. This brings us into the infratemporal fossa. This is the lateral pterygoid muscle. It's been divided here. The maxillary artery runs forward, passing either below the lateral pterygoid muscle, as it does here, or through it. The maxillary artery has many branches. These include branches to the muscles of mastication, and alveolar branches to the upper and lower jaws. This important early branch, the middle meningeal artery, passes upward. It goes through this opening in the bone, the foramen spinosum. From the foramen spinosum, which is here, the middle meningeal artery fans out, creating these grooves on the inside of the cranium. The middle meningeal artery runs within the thickness of the dura. It supplies the dura and much of the skull. We'll return to where we were on the maxillary artery. Here it gives off an infraorbital branch that passes through the inferior orbital fissure. Then the maxillary artery turns medially, entering the pterygomaxillary fissure, where it ends by branching to supply the lining of the nasal cavity and the palate. Now we'll move on to take a look at the major veins of the head and neck. Outside the cranial cavity, the smaller veins generally run close to the corresponding arteries. We'll look only at the larger veins, starting with the principal vein of the head and neck region, the internal jugular vein. To see the internal jugular vein, we'll start with a dissection in which it's been removed. Here's the internal carotid artery about to enter the carotid canal. The internal jugular vein begins here at the jugular foramen, where, as we've seen, it's continuous with the sigmoid sinus. Now we'll add the internal jugular vein to the picture. The upper part of the internal jugular vein lies behind the internal carotid artery. 
it lies just medial to the styloid process, and medial also to the styloid muscles, and the posterior belly of the digastric. Just below the level of the angle of the mandible, which will add to the picture, the internal jugular vein receives this large vein, the common facial vein. The common facial vein is formed by a joining together of veins that drain the face, the infratemporal region, the oral and nasal cavities, and the larynx. The internal jugular vein continues down the neck, behind the common carotid artery, and lateral to it. It's crossed by the omohyoid muscle. Down here behind the clavicle, the internal jugular vein ends by joining with the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. As shown in tape 3, the two brachiocephalic veins pass through the superior thoracic aperture. In the thorax, the two brachiocephalic veins join to form the superior vena cava. The internal jugular vein is covered over by the sternocleidomastoid muscle. We'll add just the upper and lower ends of the muscle to the picture. Here's the lower end of the muscle. Here's the upper end. Above, the vein lies slightly in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Below, it lies just lateral to the interval between the sternal and clavicular insertions of the muscle. We'll add the rest of the sternocleidomastoid muscle to the picture. Then we'll add the major superficial veins of the neck. This is the external jugular vein. It's formed below the ear by a joining of veins from the scalp and face. The external jugular vein crosses the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and passes behind the clavicle to join the subclavian vein, which is here. This is the anterior jugular vein. It's quite small in this individual. It also empties into the subclavian vein. To make the veins clearly visible in the dissection we've seen, they were filled with a colored material. Normally, when we're upright and at rest, gravity keeps the veins of the head and neck almost empty. They fill up when we lie down or raise our intrathoracic pressure. Now that we've looked at the principal veins, Let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels of the head and neck. Here's the subclavian artery, the thyrocervical trunk, the inferior thyroid artery, and the vertebral artery. Here's the common carotid, dividing into the external and internal carotids. Within the cranium, here are the vertebral and internal carotid arteries, the ophthalmic artery, the anterior cerebral, anterior communicating, posterior communicating, and middle cerebral arteries. Here are the inferior cerebellar arteries, the superior cerebellar arteries, and the posterior cerebral arteries. Here's the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus, the cavernous sinus, the superior petrosal and inferior petrosal sinuses. Here's the external carotid again. Here's the superior thyroid artery, the lingual artery, the facial artery, the occipital and posterior auricular arteries, the ascending pharyngeal, the superficial temporal, and maxillary arteries. Here's the internal jugular vein, the common facial vein, the external jugular, and anterior jugular veins. That brings us to the end of this section on the blood vessels of the head and neck. In the next section, we'll look at the eye and its surroundings.